Chapter 20 Sir Roger had established himself on the planet we named New Avalon. Our folk needed a rest, and he needed time to settle many questions of securing that vast kingdom which has already fallen to him. He was furthermore in secret negotiation with the Wurzger governor of an entire star cluster. This person seemed willing to yield up all he controlled could we give him suitable bribes and guarantees. The haggling went slowly, but Sir Roger felt confident of its outcome. They know so little about the detection and use of traitors out here, he remarked to me, that I can buy this fellow for less than an Italian city. Our allies never attempted this, for they imagined that the Wurzger nation must be as solid as their own. Yet isn't it logic that so vast a sprawl of estates separated by days and weeks of travel, must in many ways resemble a European country, even though it's more corruptible. Since they lack the true faith, I said. Hmm, well, yes, no doubt. Though I've never found Christians who refused a bribe on religious grounds, I was thinking that the Wurzger type of government commands no fealty. At any rate, we had a little while of peace, camped in a dale beneath dizzyingly tall cliffs. A waterfall rushed arrow straight into a lake more clear than glass, ringed with trees. Even our sprawling, brawling English camp could not hurt so much beauty. I had settled down outside my own little tent, at ease in a rustic chair. My hard studies laid aside for a moment. I indulged myself with a book from home, a relaxing chronicle of the miracles of St. Cosmas. As if from far off, I heard the crackle of fire gun practice, the zap of archery, the cheerful clatter of quarterstaff play. I was almost asleep when feet thudded to a halt beside me. Startled, I blinked upward at the terrified face of a baronial esquire. Brother Parvis, he said, in God's name, come at once. I gathered my cassock and trotted at his heels. Sunlight and blossoming bowers and birdsong overhead were suddenly remote. I knew only the leap of my heart and the realization of how few and weak and far from home we were. What's awry? I know not, said the esquire. A message came on the far speaker, relayed from space by one of our patrol ships. Sir Owain Montbell desired private talk with my lord. I know not what was spoken on the narrow beam. But Sir Roger came staggering out like a blind man and roared for you. Oh, Brother Parvis, it was horrible to see. I thought that I should pray for us all, doomed if the Baron's strength and cunning could no longer uphold us. But I was at once too full of pity for him alone. He had borne too much, too long with never a soul to share the burden. All brave saints, I thought, stand by him now. Red John Hayward mounted guard outside the portable jail shelter. 
he had spied his master's strickenness and dashed thither from the target range. With strung bow, he bellowed at the crowd that milled and muttered, Get you back, back to your places, God's death. I'll put this arrow through the first by Our Lady's sod to pester my lord, and break the by Our Lady's neck or the next. Go, I say. I brushed the giant aside and entered. It was hot within the shelter. Sunlight filtered through its translucency, had a thick colored. Mostly, it was furnished with homely things, leather, tapestry, armor. But one shelf held instruments of alien manufacture, and a large far speaker set was placed on the floor. Sir Roger slumped in a chair before this, chin on breast, his big hands hanging limp. I stole up behind him and laid my own hand on his shoulder. What is the matter, sire? I asked as softly as might be. He hardly moved. Go away, he said. You called for me. I knew not what I was doing. This is between myself and... Go away. His voice was flat, but it took my whole small stock of courage to walk around in front of him and say, I presume your receiver inscribed the message as usual? Aye, no doubt. I'd best wipe out that record. No. His gray gaze lifted toward me. I remembered a wolf I had once seen trapped when the townsfolk closed in to make an end of it. I don't want to harm you, Brother Parvis, he said. Then don't, I answered brusquely and stooped to turn on the playback. He gathered his powers in great weariness. If you see that message, he warned, I must kill you for my honor. I thought back to my boyhood. There had been various short, pungent, purely English words in common use. I selected one and pronounced it. From the corner of an eye, as I squatted by the dials, I saw his jaw fall. He sank back into his chair. I pronounced another English word for good measure. Your honor lies in the well-being of your people, I added. You're not fit to judge anything which can so shake you as this. Sit down and let me hear it. He huddled in to himself. I turned a switch. Sir Owain's face leaped onto the screen. I saw that he was also gaunt, the handsomeness less evident the eyes dry and burning. He spoke in formal, courteous wise, but could not hide his exultation. I cannot remember his exact words, nor do they matter. He told his lord what had happened. He was now in space with the stolen ship. He had approached close to New Avalon to beam this call, but taken to his heels again immediately after it was spoken. There was no hope of finding him in that vastness. If we yielded, he said, he would arrange the transportation home of our folk, and Branathar assured him the Wurzger Emperor would promise to keep hands off Terra. If we did not yield, the recreant would go to Wurzgorikson and reveal the truth about us. Then, if necessary, the folk could recruit enough French or Saracen mercenaries to destroy us. 
but probably the demoralization of our allies as they learned our weakness would suffice to bring them to terms. In either case, Sir Roger would never see his wife and children again. Lady Catherine entered the screen. I recall her words, but I do not choose to write them down. When the record was ended, I wiped it out myself. We were silent a while, my lord and I. At last, well, he said like an old man. I stared at my feet. Montbell said they would re-enter communication range at a certain hour tomorrow to hear your decision. It would be possible to send numerous unmanned ships loaded with explosive fused by a magnetic nose along that far speaker beam. Belike he could be destroyed. You've already asked much of me, Brother Parvis, said Sir Roger. Still, his words had no life in them. Ask me not to slay my lady and children, unshriven. I, ah, could the vessel be captured? No, I answered myself. It would be a practical impossibility. Any single shot which struck close enough to a little ship like that would more likely make dust of it than merely disable its engines. Or else the damage would be small, and he would at once flee faster than light. The Baron raised his congealed face. Whatever happens, he said, no one is to know my lady's part in this. Do you understand? She's not in her right mind. Some fiend has possessed her. I regarded him with a pity still greater than before. You're too brave to hide behind such foolishness, I said. Well, what can I do? He growled. You can fight on. Hopelessly. Once Montbell has gone to work worse Gorgson. Or you can accept the terms offered. Ha! How long do you think the Blueskins would actually leave Terra in peace? Sir Owain must have some reason to believe they will, I said cautiously. He's a fool. Sir Roger's fist smote the arm of the chair. He sat up straight and the harshness of his voice was a lonely token of hopefulness to me. Or else he's a blacker Judas than he has ever even confessed, and hopes to become viceroy after the conquest. See you not, tis more than the wish for land which will force the Wurzgerix to overrun our planet. Tis the fact that our race has proven itself mortally dangerous. As yet, men are helpless at home. But given a few centuries to prepare, men might well build their own spaceships and overwhelm the universe. The Wurzgerix have suffered in this war, I argued feebly. They'll need time to regain what they have lost even if our allies surrender all occupied worlds. They might very likely find it expedient to leave Terra alone for a hundred years or so. Till we're safely dead, Sir Roger nodded heavily. Aye, there's the great temptation, the real bribe. Yet would we not burn in hell if we thus broke faith with unborn children? It may be the best we can do for our race, I said. Whatever lies beyond our own power is in the charge of God. But no, 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 he twisted his hands together. I can't, better to die now like men. Yet Catherine, after another stillness, 
I said. It may not be too late to dissuade Sir Owain. No soul is irredeemably lost while this life remains. You could recall his honor and point out to him how foolish it is to rely on Wersker promises and offer him forgiveness and great position and the use of my wife, he jeered. But in a moment, it may be. I'd far lifer spill his evil brains, but perhaps, hi, perhaps a talk. I would even try to humble myself. Will you aid me, Brother Parvis? I must not curse him to his face. Will you strengthen my spirit? The next evening we departed New Avalon. Sir Roger and I went alone in a tiny unarmed space lifeboat. We ourselves were but little stronger. I had my cassock and rosary as always, no more. He was clad in a yeoman's doublet and hose, though he wore sword and dagger and his gilt spurs were on his boots. His big form sat the pilot chair as if it were a saddle, but his eyes, turned heavenward, were full of winter. We had told our captains that this was only a short flight to view some special thing Sir Owain had fetched. The camp sensed the lie and rumbled with unease. Red John broke two quarterstaffs before he restored order. It seemed to me as I embarked that our enterprise was suddenly rusted. Men sat so quiet. It was a windless evening. Our banners drooped on their staffs, and I noticed how faded and torn they were. Our boat split the blue sky and entered blackness like Lucifer expelled. Briefly, I glimpsed a battleship patrolling in orbit and would have been much comforted to have those great guns at my back, but we must take only this helpless splinter. Sir Owain had made that clear when we talked a second time along the far speaker beam. If you wish, de Tourneville, We'll receive you for a parley, but you must come alone in a plain lifeboat and unarmed. Oh, very well, you can have your friar too. I shall tell you what orbit to assume. At a certain point thereof, my ship will meet you. If my telescopes and detectors show any sign of treachery on your part, I'll go straight towards Gorikson instead. We accelerated outward through a silence that thickened. Once, I ventured to say, if you two can be reconciled, it will put heart back in our people. I think then they would truly be in invincible. Catherine and I, barked Sir Roger, why, I, I meant you and Sir Owain, I stammered, but the truth opened up before me. I had indeed been thinking of the lady. Owain was nothing in himself. Sir Roger was the one on whom our whole fate rested, yet he could not continue much longer, sundered from her who possessed his soul. She and the children they had had together were the reason he came so meekly to beg Owain's indulgence. Outward and outward we fled. The planet shrank to a tarnished coin behind us. I had not felt so alone before, not even when we were first born from our Earth. But at last, a few of the many stars were obscured. 
I saw the lean black form of the spaceship grow as it matched velocities. We could have tossed a bombshell by hand and destroyed it, but Sir Owain knew well we would never do that while Catherine and Robert and Matilda were aboard. Presently, a magnetic grapnel clanked against our hull. The ships drew together, portal to portal, a cold kiss. We opened our own gates and waited. Branathar himself stepped through. Victory flamed in him. He recoiled when he saw Sir Roger's glaive and miscarried. You were to have no weapons, he rasped. Oh? Oh, I, I... The Baron looked dully down at the blades. I never thought. They're like my spurs, insignia of what I am. Not more. Give them over, said Branathar. Sir Roger unbelted both and handed them to the Wersker in their sheaths. Branathar passed them to another blue and searched our bodies himself. No hidden guns, he decided. I felt my cheeks burn at the insult, but Sir Roger hardly seemed to notice. Very well, said Branathar. Follow me. We went down a corridor to the salon cabin. Sir Owain sat behind a table of inlaid wood. He himself was somber in black velvet, but jewels flashed on the hand which covered a fire gun laid in front of him. Lady Catherine wore a gray gown and wimple. She had overlooked a stray lock of hair which fell across her brow like smoldering fire. Sir Roger halted just within the cabin door. Where are the children? he said. They are in the bedchamber with my maidservants, his wife spoke like a machine. They are well. Be seated, sire, urged Sir Owain glibly. His gaze flickered about the room. Branathar had lain the sword and dagger down by him and stood on his right hand. The other Wersger, and a third one who had waited here, stood with folded arms by the entrance, just behind us. I took them to be the physician and navigator which had been mentioned. The two gunners must be at their turrets, the pilot by his controls, in case aught went amiss. Lady Catherine stood, a waxen image, against the rear wall to Owain's left. You bear no grudges, I trust, said the recreant. All's fair in love and war. Catherine lifted a hand of protest. In war only, she could scarce be heard. The hand fell down again. Sir Roger and I kept our feet. He spat on the deck. Owain reddened. Look, you, he exclaimed. Let's have no cant about broken vows. Your own position is more than doubtful. You've arrogated yourself to the right of creating noblemen out of peasants and serfs, disposing of fiefs, dealing with foreign kings, why, you'd make yourself a king if you could. What then of your pledges to Sovereign Edward? I've done naught to his harm, Sir Roger answered, shaken of voice. If ever I find Terra, I'll add my conquests to his domain. Until then we must manage somehow, 
and I have no choice but to establish our own feudality. That may have been the case hitherto, Sir Owain admitted, his smile returned. But you should thank me, Roger, that I've lifted this necessity from you. We can go back home. Has Wurzger cattle? I think not, but do be seated, you two. I shall have wine and cakes brought. You're my guests now, you know. Nay, I'll not break bread with you. Then you'll starve to death, said o Sir Owain merrily. Roger became like stone. I noticed for the first time that Lady Catherine wore a holster, but that it was empty. Owain must have gotten her weapon on some pretext. Now he alone was armed. He turned grave as he read our expressions. My lord, he said, when you offered to come parley, you could not expect me to refuse such a chance. You'll remain with us. Catherine stirred. Owain, no, she cried. You never told me. You said he'd be free to leave this ship if... He turned his fine profile to her view and said gently, Think, my lady. Was it not your highest wish to save him? But you wept, fearing his pride would never let him yield. Now he is a prisoner. Your wish is granted. All the dishonor is on myself. I bear that burden lightly, t since tis for my lady's dear sake. She trembled so I could see it. I had no part in this, Roger, she pleaded. I never imagined. Her husband did not look at her. His voice chopped hers off. What do you plan, Montbell? This new situation has given me new hopes answered the other knight. I confess I was never overly joyed at the thought of bargaining with the Wurzgrix. Now tis not needful. We can go directly home. The weapons and chests of gold aboard this vessel will win me as much as I care to possess. Branifar, the only non-human there who understood his English, barked. Hoy, what of me and my friends here? Sir Owain answered coolly. Why should you not accompany us? Without Sir Roger de Tourneville, the English cause must soon collapse, so you have done your duty to your own people. I've studied your way of thinking. A particular place means nothing to you. We'll pick up some females of your race along the way. As my loyal vassals, you can win as much power and land on Terra as anywhere else. Your descendants will share the planet with mine. True, you sacrifice a certain amount of wanted social intercourse, but on the other hand, you gain a degree of liberty your own government never allowed you. He had the weapons, yet I think Branathar yielded to the argument itself, and that his slow mumble of agreement was honest. And us, breathed Lady Catherine, you and Roger shall have your estate in England, pledged Sir Owain. I'll add thereto, one at Winchester. Perhaps he was also honest. Or perhaps he thought, once he was the overlord of Europe, he could do as he wished with her husband and herself. She was too shaken to foresee the latter chance. I saw her suddenly unclouded with dream. She faced Sir Roger, smiling and weeping, my love, we can go home again. 
He glanced at her once. But what of the folk we've led hither? he asked. Nay, I cannot risk taking them with us, Sir Owain shrugged. They're low-born anyway. Sir Roger nodded. Ah, he said. So. Once more he looked at his wife. Then he kicked backward. The spur of knighthood stuck into the belly of the worsker behind him. He ripped downward. Falling with the same motion, he rolled across the deck. Sir Owain yelled and leaped up. His fire gun blasted the air. It missed. The Baron was too quick. Reached upward, seized the other stupefied worsker, and pulled him down on top. The second fire blast struck that living shield. Sir Roger heaved the corpse before him, rising and advancing in one gigantic surge of motion. Owain had time for a last shot, which charred the dead flesh. Then Roger threw the body across the table, into the other man's face. Owain went down beneath it. Sir Roger snatched for his sword. Brennethor had already put a hand on it. Sir Roger got the dagger instead. It flared from the sheath. I heard the thunk as he drove it through Brennethor's hand into the table to the very hilt. Wait there for me, snarled Sir Roger. He drew the sword. Haro, God send the right. Sir Owain had scrambled free and risen, still clutching the gun. I found myself a pant just across the table from him. He aimed squarely at the Baron's midriff. I promised the saints many candles and smacked my rosary across the traitor's wrist. He howled. The gun fell from his hand and skidded across the table. Sir Roger's great glaive whistled. Owain was barely fast enough to dodge. The edged steel crashed into the wood. A moment Sir Roger must struggle to free it. The fire gun lay on the deck. I dove for it. So did Lady Catherine who had dashed around the table. Our brows met. When my wits came back, I was sitting up, and Roger was chasing Owain out the door. Catherine screamed. Roger stopped as if noosed. She rose in a swirl of garments. The children, my lord, they're aft, in the bedchamber, where the extra weapons are. He cursed and sped out. She followed. I picked myself up, a trifle groggily, the gun which they had both forgotten in my grasp. Branathar bared teeth at me. He tugged against the knife that pinioned him, but only made the blood run faster. I judged him safely held. My attention was elsewhere. The Wurzger, whom my master had disemboweled, was still alive, but would not remain so for long. A moment I hesitated. Where did my duty lie? To my lord and his lady, or to a dying heathen? I bent above the contorted blue face. Father, he gasped. I know not who, or who he called upon, but I led him through such poor rites as the circumstances allowed and held him while he died. I pray he may at least have won to limbo. Sir Roger came back, wiping his sword. He grinned all over. I have rarely seen such joy in a man. The little wolf he whooped. Aye, 
Norman blood is never easy to tell. What happened? I asked, rising in my soiled raiment. Owain didn't make for the arm's chest after all, Sir Roger told me. He must have turned forward instead to the control turret, but the other crewmen, the gunners, had heard the fight. Judging the chance ripe and the need clear, they went to equip themselves. I saw one of them pass through the boudoir door. The other was at his heels, armed with a long wrench. I fell upon him with my sword, but he fought well and it took a while to get him slain. Meantime, Catherine pursued the first and fought him barehanded till he struck her down. Those chicken-headed maidservants did not but cower and scream as expected. But then, listen, Brother Parvis, my son, Robert, opened the weapon's chest, took forth a gun, and plugged that Wurzger as neatly as Red John could have. Oh, the little devil cub! My lady entered. Her braids hung loose, and one fair cheek was purpled with a bruise. But she said, as impersonally as any sergeant reporting an assignment of pickets, I quieted the children down. Poor tiny Matilda, murmured her husband. Was she very much frightened? Lady Catherine looked indignant. They both wanted to come fight. Wait here, he said. I'll go deal with Owain and the pilot. She drew a shaken breath. Must I forever hide away when my lord goes into peril? He stopped still and looked upon her. But I thought he began, oddly helpless. That I betrayed you merely to win home again? Aye. She stared at the desk. I think you'll forgive me for that long, ere I can ever forgive myself. Yet I did what seemed best. For you, too. I was confused. Twas like a fever dream. You should not have left me alone so long, my lord. I missed you too much. Very slowly he nodded. Tis I who must beg pardon, he said. God grant me years enough to become worthy of you. Clasping her shoulders. But remain here. Tis needful you guard yon blue face. If I should kill Owain and the pilot, do that she cried in upsurging fury. I'd life or not, he said, with the same gentleness as he used toward her. Looking upon you, I can understand him so well. But if worse comes to worse, Branathar can guide us home. So watch him. She took the gun from me and sat down. The nailed captain stood captive stood rigid with defiance. Come, Brother Parvis, said Sir Roger. I may need your skill with words. He carried his sword and had thrust a fire gun from the weapon chest into his belt. We made our way along a corridor, up a ramp, and so to the entrance of the control turret. Its door was shut, locked from within. Sir Roger beat upon it with the pommel of his glaive. You two in there, he shouted, yield yourselves. And if we do not, Sir Owain's voice drifted faintly through the panels. If not else, said Roger starkly, I'll wreck the engines and depart in my boat leaving you adrift. But see here, I've rid myself of anger. Everything has ended for the best, and we shall indeed go home, after these stars have been made safe for Englishmen. 
You and I were friends once, Owain. Give me your hand again, and I swear no harm shall come to you. Silence lay heavy, until the man behind the door said, Aye, you were never one to break an oath, were you? Very well, come on through, Roger. I heard the bolt click down. The Baron put his hand to the door. I know not what impelled me to say, Wait, sire, and shove myself before him with unheard of ill manners. What is it? He blinked, bemused in his gladness. I opened the door and stepped over the threshold. Two iron bars smashed down on my head. The rest of this adventure must needs be told from hearsay, for I was not to come to my senses for a week. I toppled in blood, and Sir Roger thought me slain. The moment they saw it was not the Baron they had gotten, Owain and the pilot attacked him. They were armed with two unscrewed stanchions, as long and heavy as swords. Sir Roger's blade flashed. The pilot threw up his club. The blade glanced off in a shower of sparks. Sir Roger howled so the walls echoed. echoed. You murderers of innocence! His second blow knocked the bar out of a numbed hand. At his third, the blue head sprang from his shoulders and bounced down the ramp. Catherine heard the uproar. She went to the door of the salon and looked forward, as if terror could sharpen her eyes to pierce the walls between. Branathar set his teeth together. He seized the miscarried with his free hand. Muscles jumped forth in his shoulders. Few men could have drawn that blade, but Branathar did. My lady heard the noise and whirled. Pranathar was rounding the table. His right hand hung torn, a stream with blood, but the knife gleamed in his left. She raised her gun. Back, she yelled. Put that down, he said scornfully. You'd never use it. You never saw enough stars, Zatera, with wise enough vision. If anything goes wrong in the bows, I am your only way home. She looked into the eyes of her husband's enemy and shot him dead. Then she ran toward the turret. Sir Owain Montbell had scampered back into that chamber. He could not fend off the sheer fury of Sir Roger's assault. The Baron drew his gun. Owain snatched up a book and held it before his breast. Have a care, he panted. This is the ship's log. It has the notes on Terra's position. There are no others. You lie. There's Branathar's mind. Nonetheless, Sir Roger thrust the gun back in his belt as he stalked forward. I'm sorry to outrage clean steel with your blood, for you killed Brother Parvis, and you're going to die. Owain poised. His stanchion was a clumsy weapon, but he raised his arm and hurled it. Struck across the brow, Sir Roger lurched backward. Owain sprang, snatched the gun from the stunned man's belt, and dodged a feeble sword slash. He scuttled clear, yelling his triumph. Roger stumbled toward him. Owain took aim. Catherine appeared in the door. Her gun flamed. The book of her journey vanished in smoke and ash. 
Owain screamed in anguish. Coldly, she fired again, and he fell. She flung herself into Roger's arms and wept. He comforted her, yet I wonder which of them gave the most strength to the other. Afterward, he said ruefully, I fear we've managed ill. Now the way home is indeed lost. It doesn't matter, she whispered. Where you are, there is England. <laughs>